I like the way Travis had opened about acknowledging the anxiety that goes in presenting, which is ironic in the context of the Mental Health Summit. Um, I used to take beta blockers before I spoke in public, but then before a big talk, uh, I looked in the mirror, my pupils were this big, and I was kind of high. And Barry said my talk was really good. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> Not on beta blockers now. Um, I actually don't need to go into the background because Travis did a beautiful job of um, highlighting this research, and so did Barry. Um, basically highlighting the mental health disparities among GBMSM and its links to HIV. So I'm just, I'm not gonna repeat it. I'll come back to this research in a moment. But in addition to research, there's also this growing popular discourse on uh, a mental health epidemic among gay, bi, uh, MSM. And I'll just do a little plug, I'll come back to this, that this issue of mental health, although it uh, affects gay men in particular ways, is not just happening among gay men, that there is a broader conversation happening in general among multiple uh, populations about mental health, and we could actually see this as an opportunity. I'll get to that in, uh, in a moment. So factoring in all these things, my research team, and I'll explain the research project a bit more in a moment, but this is part of the ENGAGE uh, study, uh, we decided to focus on these two research questions. The first is, how are GBMSM making sense of their mental health and mental health needs? And what are GBMSM's decision-making processes and experiences accessing and receiving mental health services and supports? So those were the starting questions. How we did this is um, the qualitative component, which uh, I was leading with Daniel Grace. Uh, we recruited through the National Engage study, uh, which is using respond-driven sampling in Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. And if you don't know much about the study, please speak to me more, or Trevor Hart, or uh, Ricky Rodriguez. Um, and basically, participants who completed the ENGAGE study, which uh, included a survey and a biomedical screening, uh, they were asked, there was an uh, extra email recruitment, if they were interested in talking about mental health and their experiences accessing services. And uh, those that said yes, they came in and they spoke uh, with me. I did 24 active interviews. I'll explain what I mean by active in a moment. These were all based in Toronto, despite the fact that the study is uh, national. Uh, we were thinking of pilot studies in, in Montreal at the moment, and they were analyzed in, in vivo using grounded theory. So these are the interview domains. Uh, the first was just uh, going over the guy's current mental health state. The second was their experiences with mental health related challenges. The third was their experiences accessing mental health services and supports. The fourth were their experiences with substance use and accessing supports for substance use issues. And their fifth were their experiences managing sexual health and HIV related health. Active interviews, though, are not really structured interviews. So despite the fact that these are categorized in these different ways, it's just a way to explain it to a broader audience. I actually, um, the goal is to follow the participant's speech. So a lot of these things are kind of mixed in together because they're not particularly siloed. And what I can say is I've done quite a few qualitative interviews, but these were some of the most difficult I've ever done. It was listening to a lot of pain repeatedly, and I'm saying that acknowledging that this is the work that so many of you do in this room daily, and that you should be uh, uh, very proud of that type of work, because even just doing it for two months, it was really exhausting. Uh, just going through uh, some quick demos. So uh, we had a bit of diversity. Uh, our age group, uh, we had quite a few within the 30 to 40 range. Uh, our sample leaned a little bit white. Um, we had mostly cis, uh, cisgendered men in our sample. Uh, we spoke to one trans man and one gendered non-binary man. Uh, in terms of HIV status, we had nine HIV positive guys, of which eight were undetectable and one were detectable. And we had seven that have taken PrEP um, or were currently taking PrEP of, of the guys that were HIV negative. So two initial analyses trajectories. I'm gonna focus on the second, but the first is just that um, focusing on the difficulties of accessing mental health services in Toronto. And the main thesis that we're working through, because this is preliminary, is that the experiences of accessing mental health services and supports can be so stressful that they actually aggravate the very anxieties and depression participants were seeking to address. So it's just kind of interesting that we're saying you should seek support, but in so doing so, it's actually causing the problems that they're seeking to address. 
Uh, there are numerous complex barriers to entry, including costs and trauma. I'll do a little plug around <clears throat> the trauma associated with psychiatry for many of our participants and a lot of underwhelming service experiences. I really need to go through ahead. So this presentation is mostly going to focus on the evolving landscape of HIV prevention and treatment on mental health. So a lot of participants spoke optimistically about the benefits of PrEP and undetectable viral load on their health and spoke about this as a combination. So there's one quote right here. But I think with PEP and PrEP and now the undetectable thing being uninfectable or untransmissible, I think things have changed. And this was something that was repeated throughout all of the interviews. So what we noticed was two contradictory kind of narratives. One, HIV medications discussed as having positive effects on mental health. But two, HIV medications also positioned as having limited capacities to address mental health. So it's important to think about these two things as working together. So in terms of positive effects on mental health, I'm just going to go into the, um, um, the actual quotes. So some made a separation between their HIV-related health from their mental health. So this is a person living with HIV. Well, I don't really talk too much about HIV with my psychotherapist. I'm talking more about why I have bad body image, why, you know, I panic at work sometimes because I think I'm in trouble and I'm going to lose my job. And this was the participant who had the previous quote. So simultaneously, we're in a new era of PrEP and undetectable viral load, and HIV is not the main thing that I'm actually stressing about. There are other things that I'm worried about. With this PrEP user, a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. I have more control. I have more agency over my sexual health. Uh, I have more empowerment. I'm not scared anymore. And with this PrEP user, and this is particularly interesting, so similarly, I can say right off the bat that I used to be a lot more anxious about sexual health before I started PrEP and before I started seeing a doctor regularly. I would say that seeing my doctor regularly actually is more comforting to me than the PrEP itself. And I think this is important. It highlights what uh, Travis had said earlier, where where what is actually happening is that in seeking a sexual health service, it's actually talking that out with a professional that is having effects in addition to the actual uh, benefits of PrEP. But it is important that we focus also on how uh, PrEP and undetectable viral load and treatment had limited abilities to affect mental health. First, mental health is not reducible to sexual health or HIV-related concerns. And we've heard that repeated throughout the conference by different people. PrEP was not considered a suitable strategy by some. So while it's beneficial for some people, if, it's not, if it doesn't make sense for others, it's not going to affect their anxiety or depression. Third, uh, we saw in the sample continued anxiety over sex despite knowledge about PrEP and undetectable viral load, uh, continued stigma and shame associated with living with HIV, and mental health-related side effects of HIV medications. So a lot of people talked about nightmares and reduced sleep, which actually affected their mental health. So this is a PrEP user when asked about PrEP's effect on his mental health. Neutral. I'm glad I went on it and I've learned some things and done some new things. I think being on PrEP helped me enjoy bareback sex more, but I wouldn't necessarily say that I was doing anything for my mental health. And going back to what Raheem said, we normally, we, we have this heavy focus on, um, when we're looking at GBMSM on sex and on sexual health, that we think that PrEP might be a grand solution, but this guy's saying, no, it didn't do anything for my um, mental health. This is, I'm not going to read this quote, but this is a, a person who's on PrEP and is talking about his fears, not just around having serial variant sex, but actually having anal sex in general, even with HIV negative men, despite knowing about undetectable viral load. And he talks about being a child of the 90s and the fear that he has. So even though he rationally understands these solutions, it's actually not enough to address his uh, anxieties and his fears. And in fact, his ability to not be sexually free now that he's on PrEP is causing him to have additional anxieties and shame. Uh, this is a participant living with HIV. Uh, he talks about how he's HIV positive and his HIV related health, he's undetectable, his viral load counts are all great, uh, but his mental health is, you know, it's up and down. So we see this disconnect around the fact that even though his HIV related health and his undetectable viral, he has an undetectable viral load is there, that's not really affecting the other sources of stress in his life or the things affecting his mental health. The other thing that's really important, it goes to the talk that John uh, had this morning, was this disconnect is actually interesting because this participant uh, spoke about how um, 
So he made this disconnect between his HIV health and his mental health, but he also informed me that he hadn't told anybody about four people he's told that he's HIV positive in 24 years, right? Which shows that there's some stigma and shame that he's not associating necessarily with his mental health, but we could think about the implications. And lastly, these are two people who I would say have a syndemic profile who talk about being undetectable and talk about the benefits of U equal U, but also talk about how they're not dealing with their HIV diagnosis that well in terms of their psychology or in they're still dealing with internalized stigma and shame. And this is because even though their HIV related health, they rationally understand it as fine, going back to what Barry said, their HIV diagnosis um, signify part of this broader kind of syndemic profile, abuse, um, going through the refugee claimant uh, process, uh, sexual violence, etc., that they've not yet dealt with. So what are the implications very quickly? The first, this is important, and this goes to what Barry said, access to an, an increased discourse on new treatment and prevention options can have longer term positive benefits on GBMSM's mental health and well-being. I think that's an important and exciting finding. However, the story is not that simple. The long-term effects of the epidemic on mental health remain, so even when we have PrEP and undetectable viral load, the effects of HIV on our communities are still going to exist. Very importantly, HIV is not the sole cause of these men's mental distress. The sources of uh, trauma and stress are multiple and complex, and quite, uh, and we've seen this in different presentations, but economic precarity, uh, uh, the rising cost of living, um, in addition to minority stress and abuse, and this is what relates back to um, to what I was saying before about it's not just gay men. Yes, we can offer counseling, but we also have to offer critiques about how capitalism is corroding the health of all people. And so we want to give them counseling, but if we don't actually talk about how we're overworked and overstimulated and under, underpaid, we're actually not going to address this problem at all, even if we get uh, address HIV and minority stress. And so I'll just leave it with the last point, which goes to this, is that um, since these issues are complex, the solutions we offer to remedy our mental health epidemic must also be multiple and complex. So thank you.